Hello, fellow Raxians. Today, I want to talk about balance. Now, I usually avoid this topic like the plague. I hate it. Who cares? I don't care if that tank is slightly floatier than mine, or if that max is slightly shotgunnier than mine, or if that weapon has a little less bullet drop. Like, I want to see epic 200 person versus 200 person battles with tracers all over, tanks crashing into each other, endless explosions. Like, let's work on that. Let's make that happen. Make it happen more often. Make it happen better. And who cares if the weapons aren't perfectly balanced? But there are two major complaints I see from people that don't stick with the game. One is performance and one is balance. And balance is a pretty large topic. It is as nitpicky as that weapon does a little more damage than this one, all the way to the wide. This game is too pay to win. I can't unlock everything in two hours, and that means I don't have the same weapons as everyone else, and that means it's not balanced, and it's unfair, and the game's no fun. So I'm just going to start unpacking balance a bit. Cover some of the sticking points I've seen. Maybe make a few suggestions on where things could be slightly improved. And then really look forward to your comments and to have a little more discussion surrounding balance in the game. When I think of balance in Planetside 2, the first thing that comes to mind is the Combined Arms Initiative. It was a patch that was really all about balance. And as everyone knows, it was a very contentious patch that I really just stayed out of while it was going down. And afterwards, I regretted that decision. Again, it went back to, since I didn't care about balance, I was just going to stay out of it. Let everyone that did care kind of hash it over. And the reason that is the wrong decision is because I do care about other things. I care about battle flow, I care about map flow, and I care about the end game. Because those are the very important pieces to me, but there's a lot of people that just don't care about those things. They want to have fun in their air-to-air -air Dalton Liberator. And if I don't care to stand up for their piece of the game that's very fun to them, well then, they shouldn't care about standing up for the piece of the game that's fun to me. It's worth standing up and adding your voice to say, Hey, why is the air-to-air -air Dalton Lib going away? Like, we can all understand nerfing Furies. They were this outrageous anti-infantry farming machine. But the air-to-air -air Dalton was not. And for some reason, it went away. And we never got a good explanation as to why. Looking back now, I feel like, Hey, maybe if there were just a few more people that hollered about it, myself included, maybe we wouldn't have gotten there where a whole bunch of the community lost the gameplay that they liked. Anyways, lesson learned. Fortunately, over time, they've rolled back some of the most frustrating points of the Combined Arms Initiative, and we will just have to keep the open dialogue to improve balance wherever we can. Let's dive in, shall we? Let's chat about the Flash. Now, who remembers this when the new Flash weapons came out? I don't want you to die. Oh, shit, this idea. Okay. Cloaked Starfall flashes everywhere. These teams could easily instigib tanks from the rear. And then Combined Arms Initiative had messed with the resistances and tank cannons so much that check this out. A direct hit from a main cannon doesn't kill the flash. So needless to say, it was a pretty frustrating weapon to have out there while you were trying to be a tanker. Agile, maneuverable, small, invisible vehicle that wasn't actually paper thin. So after this whole debacle caused by combined arms initiative resistance changes and a few new weapons being released, of flash teams going around and insta-killing all the lightnings and MBTs on the map. Sometimes they would even try for larger prey, like an unsuspecting ant. But not today, Bitloader. I've got a cloak too. But after they terrorized the server for a week or so, the nerf bat came down hard on the flash. It felt like a pretty huge overreaction to what was basically caused by Daybreak Games. The flash was in a relatively stable state, but then with the resist changes of CAI and the addition of new weapons, all of a sudden the platform was totally out of whack. The first round of nerfing created a really long delay to get back in the cloak, and it took a lot of energy. And that was reeled back a little bit, which calmed everyone. Still, I think a lot of people are like, the flash was fine. Why did we have to touch it? Why did we have to screw with it? 
And even though the nerf was rolled back a little bit, the flash still feels pretty severely handicapped compared to where it was. But that nerf really did cut out most of these invisible flashes coming up to vulture your tank. With the balance on the flash, I absolutely think that after the combined arms initiative, the fury on the flash has way too much AV capabilities. And even prior to combined arms initiative, when the flash could instantly go in and out of cloak, its anti-infantry capabilities were pretty severe. But I do wish it was solved more with a retooling of the weapons rather than making the cloak just annoying and painful to use. And why the heck does it take two rockets to kill these things? Like, I don't mind that they can pop out from invisibility with a shotgun or a cobalt, as long as it's a super high-risk endeavor. One rocket should end these things. Okay, let's move on. Let's chat about light assaults versus vehicles. Personally, I think light assaults are in a really good place in the infantry versus infantry gameplay. I know some people feel like it's a little imbalanced to go up against the heavy's overshield, but to me, the light assault's ability to come at infantry fights from unique and unsuspected angles allows them to get an edge on the heavy assault even though they have less effective health. But once we start putting them in the vehicle game, they are completely out of whack. This scenario is where light assaults do the most damage. Light Assaults completely nullify Sunderers as good spawn options. When they just had two sticks of C4 and explosive cross belts, they were bad enough. Now they've got rocket rifles with Typhoon rockets. They are catastrophic. You cannot leave a Sunderer anywhere without a Light Assault drifting over to it and start plinking it with its rocket rifle. Now more and more Sunderers are becoming obsolete as a spawn option. Routers are a far better choice at this point. They still just are frustrating enough to use that Sunderers still have some use. But with Light Assaults in their current state, the only way to make Sunderers at all useful again is to make them a truly mobile spawn. That is, allow Sunderers to spawn people without deploying. Now, this couldn't be a situation where you can click them on the map. There would be hundreds of spawn options when you're on lane with a big fight. No, we covered this in one of our videos. It would have to be a single button, get in the action, or whatever you want to call it, where the game would just deploy you into a vehicle in the hex you're in. So any Sunderer that is operating in that battle zone is a potential spawn point. But light assaults are too far gone to be balanced against vehicles. With Ambusher Jump Jets and C4, their ability to close gaps and do huge amounts of damage rapidly to vehicles just throws them way out of whack. They always were strong against vehicles with their drifter jets, and they've just had more and more tools poured into their kits while vehicles have actually been toned down against infantry. In this battle here on Hawson, we were having a field fight, which is awesome, and the enemy had armor superiority. Like in the base fights, that doesn't matter. The armor can't help. But the one place that armor superiority should count for something is in the field. And these guys were completely shut down by just a couple of floaty boys. Dancing through the trees with their rocket rifles. In fact, just before that clip, I was a tanker myself. But I soon realized being in a tank was useless. Their light assaults were drifting towards me. And there's nothing worse than feeling like the best way to deal with infantry is getting out of your 10-ton battle tank to pull out your pistol. Because shoot, not only is it already super difficult to hit a drifting, floating, tiny infantryman, even when you do hit him midair, it still doesn't kill him. Hey guys, we're overpopped on all the lanes. Why don't we go try to start another fight on a new lane? That'd be great, right? More fights, more fun. You come from the spawn room, I'll come from a Sunderer. Nope, that's the C4 rocket rifle sound. When you hear that, you know this fight is dead. So guys, yeah, feature creep on the light assault has become a real balanced nightmare. Okay, I know infills, engineers, medics, heavies all get something as their tool slot, right? Light assaults were sort of left out there. But I saw some great ideas for like a recon denial gun where they could shoot a dart that would counter the infiltrator's recon ability in certain areas. That would really help play into their stealthy positioning gameplay. 
And there were a few other ideas that were kicked around. But no, we went with the uh, light assaults are not awful enough with C4 already. We're going to turn them into a tanker's nightmare. Now this one, I couldn't stop laughing. If you check the minimap, I see a bounty dude in this direction. I'm trying to figure out, is it a sniper over there? Where is he? And I'm seeing these heavy assaults just shooting up in the air. And finally, I realize this is a floaty boy coming for that prowler. I'm like, A, sweet, I want that bounty. And B, oh crap, that tank is screwed. I got to go help him. So I'm running over there as a medic, watching this poor dude, Siege Minion, trying to escape this little infantry dude, and the guy already got a big piece of him with C4. And I'm hoping, hoping, watching my mini-map, that the guy's going to get a lucky shot on him, and that bounty is going to go away. But as you can see by the mini-map, the bounty's still on there, means the dude's not dead, and the prowler is still running from him. At this point, I was hearing the rocket rifle sound, and I knew the Prowler was doomed. The tank was done for, and then on the minimap, I saw the dreaded skull and crossbones. Siege Minion was down. I only hoped I wasn't too late to get vengeance on Mr. Floaty Boy for killing that Prowler. Anyways, they were obviously a duo, Minion Siege and Siege Minion. If you're watching out there, I'm sorry I didn't get to you soon enough to save your tank. I offered to pull a fully kitted Prowler out for them, in case Siege Minion was low on nanites, because I could tell Minion Siege would not have a kitted Prowler, but I got no response. Hopefully they got another one pulled right away. So guys, I don't have a solution to light assaults versus vehicles. I like that they're a good counter to maxes in infantry battles with their C4. I just wish the power balance between one floaty boy with rocket rifles and C4 and a tank was more in the tank's favor. Okay, speaking of tanks, let's jump over to MBTs. This is another complaint I get a lot. Faction X is overpowered because they have this thing Z. For example, the hill crawling mag rider. It's frustrating for people that VS has a tank that can go anywhere while the other factions don't. The same thing can be said for the Vanguard. Its shield ability allows that tank to push close range fights in a manner that the other faction tanks just can't do. And the Prowler's massive damage output potential can feel impossible to compete with. So the question of balance comes up. The first term that usually arrives in these situations is asymmetric balance. And I'd say League of Legends is the poster child for this discussion. No two heroes are directly balanced against each other. And the hero's balance against each other changes throughout a match. But League of Legends achieves asymmetric balance because it's team-based. So maybe a certain hero's ultimate or their stun locks or their damage output makes them unbalanced against a specific opponent. But by the time a team comes together, each team has some counters, each team has some tanky characters and some characters that have some good damage output. This jumble of heroes that may not really be a fun fight in one versus one engagements becomes an asymmetrically well-balanced fight. Now, does Planetside have this same effect? No, because you only have one option. You've either got the tank that can get up in some high places or run away really fast, which sure is good in some situations, but worthless in others. And your Vanguard has a nice shield for pushing, but if you get stuck in a team fight against a bunch of Prowlers and your shield's down, you're gonna have a hard time competing for damage output. And sure, you can argue across all of the engagements in Planetside, yes, it is very even. Each type of engagement favors different factions, but those hundreds of little unbalanced engagements don't make a whole. So here's my radical suggestion. And I know people are going to be immediately resistant because of faction identity. So I'm gonna take you back to the first game in the Planetside series. That is Tonerus. Tanks weren't faction specific. All the teams could pull a Mag Rider. The Mag Rider was an agile mid-range tank that really acted in more of a support fire role. The Vanguard was the heavy tank. It was really the frontline fighter. It was the grunt of the arsenal. The lightning was similar to what it is now, 
It was a very fast, low profile, light tank. And finally, while there was no Prowler, Tanaris had something called the Devastator, which was the largest tank with the most health, but it was very slow, so it had to be protected by the other light tanks, but it did act as an artillery platform, and the Prowler could be easily retooled into this role. It wasn't until Planetside 1 that they made some of these tanks faction specific. And while I agree faction identity is an extremely important thing, it should not come at the cost of balance, and in the case of MBTs, it does. I would like to see all three factions having access to all three main battle tanks. In this manner, each faction could build out a balanced armor column. Lightning tanks as the fast scout tanks, mag riders as the mid-range support tanks, vanguards as the backbone of the armor column, being the frontline close range fighters, and prowlers being retooled into a slow, long range, heavy artillery type of platform. So I know it's shocking right now that main battle tanks are so tied to the faction identity. It's tough for people to even consider, but that is arbitrary. It was changed from one game to the next, and it could be changed back. What would making a change like this do for us? First, it would eliminate all the finger pointing, saying that that faction has the OP tank. To be honest, I think all the tanks are in a pretty good place and they're all relatively in line. But no matter what you do when you have unique platforms like that and you don't have a significant variety like League of Legends does, you're going to get those complaints. Doing this immediately eliminates that issue. Second, face it guys, we're not getting more vehicles. People have always requested a wider arsenal bring more of the vehicles in from Planetside 1, and that would be awesome. Unfortunately, the game is just too small at this point to get that type of support. By giving all three factions all three MBTs, you're effectively adding two new vehicles to every faction. And then by retooling the tanks into light, medium, heavy, and long-range fire support, you're really creating a lot of unique roles new roles that can be experienced on the battlefield. You have now also added a whole bunch of tank weaponry people can buy, dump their certs or their daybreak cash into, and a couple more vehicles for people to cert out. Would it be better if they just expanded the arsenal and made faction specific, light, medium, heavy, and long range support tanks? Absolutely, without a doubt. It would be awesome if each faction had their own unique vehicles. But given where we are, that that's not happening, let's think outside of the box and back to Planetside's roots and give people all the vehicle options. I would love to see the lore expanded on VS using plasma, laser, and ray weaponry, TR using traditional live fire weaponry, and NC using ghost based weaponry. That is where the faction identity should come from. The weaponry should perform differently for each faction, even if it's on the same platform. Anyways, let me know your thoughts down in the comments. Now this video really surrounded balance between vehicles and then between infantry and vehicles. And I talked about how light assaults really have the upper hand in that discussion against vehicles. But to finish it out, I want to talk about the place where vehicles have the upper hand in the balance issue. And that is high explosive weaponry. Who's been here? You're trying to do a point hold, it's already a mess of EMP and conch grenades. And even though you are holed up in a building, there is this layer of extra damage. And that is because high explosive weaponry in Planetside 2 fires in a linear trajectory. Every teeny tiny opening in any building is a portal to a high explosive disaster for that fight. I'm gonna step back to Tanaris again because it was the pinnacle of tank combat in gaming. And I want to head something off right here in terms of what's good gameplay. When people say, but real tanks can engage targets over a mile away and have much higher projectile velocity. There's also RPAs that fly 10 miles high and drop Hellfire missiles. Real combat is intentionally unfair and unfun and not good to model gameplay around. Planetside is attempting to simulate an entire continent which is obviously a lot bigger than eight kilometers. So you need to shrink down the range of tanks to make them at all enjoyable. Now, Tanaris dealt with the issue by making the main damage dealing weapon a laser. 
The Mark IV laser had the highest punch but the shortest range. And then it trailed off to the Mark II and down to the Mark I that could shoot all the way across the map but couldn't do a lot of damage. The Vanguard came with the Mark IV laser because it was intended to be the up-close fighter, and the Mag Riders at mid-range support used the Mark II laser a lot. But where it really did things right is when it came to deal with the high explosive weaponry. It simulated artillery. You fired it in an arc, not in a straight line. The weaponry's direct damage to other tanks was almost non-existent. Fortunate to travel in an arc gave the weapon a lot of travel time, which made it much harder to use, much easier to counter, and you were effectively immune to it just by entering a building. Its power was that it had a ground shake effect that could support your tanks by throwing off the enemy's aim. In planet side, high explosive weaponry has none of these drawbacks. First, it still does a reasonable amount of damage to other tanks. Second, its travel time is only milliseconds below that of other shells. And third, there's no way for infantry to escape it. Were these guys pinned down and gonna die anyways? Sure. But with a roof over their heads, that log, they should be safe from the high explosive stuff and just have to deal with the infantry or AP cannons. Me being able to shell in there just ruins what could be a fun field fight in the vines. Hesha's ability to throw so much wide area explosive damage downrange, fast, and in a linear trajectory is completely unbalanced. There's a few things I would like to see happen in game so that high explosive weaponry is not as disruptive. First, I would like to change how the infantry health pool works. I really like the combination of shield pool and health pool in planet side. What I would like to do is make the shield portion of that health pool highly resistant to high explosive weaponry in general. Frag grenades, C4, Hesh rounds, heat rounds. While the shields are up, let's pretend they vaporize most of the shrapnel that comes the infantry's direction. Now once their shields are down and all that's exposed is the fleshy bits, obviously they should be very susceptible to shrapnel. But this game has a general high explosive weaponry problem. With so many people around and high explosive options so easily accessible, the big fights turn into explosion contests rather than shooting contests. So that first change is gonna give infantry a chance to get away from frag grenades, away from Hesh spam. While their shields will still take some damage from Hesh, it won't just immediately blow through their entire health pool. A full shield will allow them to take a few hits of high explosive weaponry, giving them a chance to react and move to a different area. Second, Hesh direct damage should go way down against tanks. In this battle, I had just finished Hesh spamming a bunch of infantry, and without hesitation, I pushed the line and murdered all the tanks with that same cannon. I could easily switch over to the infantry on the ground and dispatch them with a Hesh shot, or I could shoot directly at the tanks and do considerable damage. The only time I had trouble infantry is when I hit them directly. The shell itself should have no armor penetration values, be weak against tanks, the direct damage should one hit kill infantry. The high explosive projectiles in planet side have two components, a direct damage and an indirect damage component. And the only way it can achieve one shotting infantry and in doing weak damage to tanks is through changing the resistance values, but it can be done. Next thing we need to further balance high explosive weaponry is an arm time. Now rocket launchers already have this. They don't do their maximum explosive damage at point blank range. Hesh rounds need to have a similar effect. Low travel time, linear up close shots are too easy to land. We need to make sure tanks can't drive basically right up to the infantry and start throwing high explosive shells at their feet. They need to be far away taking large arcing shots, which are harder to gauge and harder to hit. Again, this further specializes the weapon where you really have to think about what play style you're trying to create rather than just casually pull a Hesh Lightning off a pad because you see a few targets of opportunity. And then finally, these weapons should have massive amounts of drop. That is, if infantry are fighting in a building, they should be effectively immune to Hesh rounds. I want vehicles to dominate the fights in the field. 100%, that should be their domain. I don't want them to dominate base fights. And with a linear trajectory, they do. Giving the Hesh projectiles massive drop, forcing them to fire in an arc, 
will basically allow infantry to completely escape them by going indoors. The vehicle's domain is outside, infantry own the bases. Now the one thing that will happen here is there will be a shift. Right now the tanks sit on hills and fire down into the bases. By shifting their firing trajectory to an arc, they will be able to sit underneath the bases and fire up into them. So they will post up and pick a running lane where the infantry have to be outside. Generally between the spawn room and the first building the infantry need to get to. But keep in mind, now that we've made the infantry shields more resistant to high explosives, if they're just catching one shell on the way to the building, it's no big deal. They can survive that one round of Hesh. But these places where infantry were trapped in a room trying to survive 10 rounds of Hesh just won't happen anymore because you can't get the Hesh into that building through that small door. The Ark won't allow it. And P.S. guys, I really love all the memes. Love you too, Reactive Gaming. So anyways guys, I think there is a place for Hesh, but I would like to see it more of a field role, of a support role. I want vehicles to be able to dominate infantry out in the field. But this whole vehicles high explosive spamming bases just isn't very fun. Direct damage from any high caliber shell vehicle weapon should one hit kill infantry, no matter what. But there needs to be a chance for counterplay against the high explosive weaponry and it should not be able to infiltrate itself into every single base fight. There's nothing fun about trying to do a triple stack hold when you've got three prowlers throwing high explosive shells into the point room through a teeny tiny itty bitty window that a light assault's not even supposed to get through. Now in the future, we're gonna dive into more of the infantry end. Why do these base fights devolve into an exercise of seeing how many EMP, concussion, and flash grenades you can survive? and how improving the microflow and bases will allow these types of grenades to exist in the game without completely ruining all the fights. But that will be for part two of this balanced discussion series. Anyways, fellow Araxians, that's it for right now. You can check the description or some links on my YouTube banner to find places like my Discord where you can continue on the discussion about how to improve balance in Planetside 2. And if not in Discord, another great place to leave your thoughts is right down in the comments. Thanks for watching, and until next time, I will see you Planetside. <laughs>